Wrapping up a very busy week. We had macroeconomic data. We had the Fed. We had the Treasury and some big earnings. So we have a lot to talk about today. So sit back, get comfortable. Let's go. Hello, this is Michael Loftus for Wealth and Wisdom TV, where education is the key to a successful financial future. First time here, I'm a practicing financial advisor. We have a registered investment advisory firm. So what you hear here and see, we do apply to our overall practice. Now, besides market updates, we also do podcasts, latest up here. So please do consider subscribing. As I mentioned here in the opening, a lot going on this week, right? We had some big time macroeconomic data. The Fed came out and surprised everybody. The Treasury, yes, the Treasury does make a difference today. And also earnings. Now we had some bad ones, but obviously had one that knocked it out of the park last night. So all this is moving to markets. What does it mean? And what are we doing as we go forward? Let's go to the big board and discuss. Starting things off, we always talk about process, okay? Now, in the last seven months, we've made a lot of changes, okay? Macro has been our backdrop, but macro was a little slow last year, to say the least, okay? So we've got to have quicker signals. And we've always done some technicals, but we've added even more, and we'll talk about that when we get to our overall signals and game plan. But we're still going to look at the beginning, which is the different cycles that we're in, and that comes from this macroeconomic data. Now, the data we get today is from last quarter, all right? That's the past. So we know that, right? The GDP number that came out last week was from last quarter. But going forward, okay, we do feel that it's still a cycle four situation, growth slowing and inflation decelerates. Now, that being said, same thing with trying to be quicker, our cycle calls are quicker as well. We're looking at monthly changes now as we move forward based on incoming data because last year the big curveball was all the spending from the Treasury and we have to have that as part of our process. So when you look at growth, right, last year again, this shows the deficit last year. We went from 33.1 trillion to 34 at the end of the year, right? A lot of money. Year to date, we've already spent $154 billion. Okay, so you can add that out. You know, we're about $1.8 trillion in deficit again this year. Massive amounts of money. And Jamie Dimon, who's really become uh, uh, quite the guy here with some comments, Washington faces a global market rebellion over record U.S. debt. It is a cliff. And we're heading at, towards that at 60 miles per hour. Now think about this. Last year, right, when you look at growth in GDP, we created $1.6 trillion in GDP. It's a good number, way better than anybody anticipated, but at a cost. That cost was $2.6 trillion in deficit. So, right, you got $1.6, but it cost $2.6. That's not really a good thing to do, something we have to continue to watch as we go forward, although no one in Washington at this point seems to care. Whole nother issue. So, all that liquidity creates loose finan financial conditions which is what you're seeing here. Now, loose financial conditions, not to you, not to I, not to middle America. It's financial conditions, looseness in the system. Wall Street, institutions, right? Money moving around and how things are moving as far as the plumbing. And what does that do? Well, it moves the markets, right? And that's exactly what happened last year. So this week, the Treasury came out, announced they're going to have another $760 billion in offerings this quarter to fund all of the different bills. So pretty massive numbers continue to come out. Now, when you look at that, we have the growth situation as we go forward, right? We are looking at things slowing down, all right? And that's the key. I said that in the beginning, and we're looking probably in the 2% numbers year to date. Now, inflation, this is showing you oh, since 2020, okay? We're paying 22.33% more than we were, right? Because when you get that CPI number, it's rate of change, right? That's how much average, and this is average, right? Some things are even more than that. We know that. CPI last one was 3.4, okay? That's the rate of change of how it's going up. And it has been going down, which is called 
deflation. Now, a couple things. One, we expect it to be at three, maybe even break three in the next reading in a couple weeks, but still stay in those high twos for the year. Now, I was on a call this morning. They think we're going to have deflation more in the one type area. So I think to be determined, and that, of course, is going to change a lot of things as well. So next up, let's take a look at those charts. So we look at the charts and we look at buying things. We have two different time frames, right? Three weeks or less, three months or less. So first I'll show the weekly chart, which gives us that three months or less. You know, what are we seeing here? Anything in particular? Not sure about that one left over from before, but up top, right? That's relative strength. And at this point, we are definitely showing overbought conditions. So that's something that concerns me on the overall chart, right? And you see where we're going on that. Now, the next one that I'm going to take a look at, if I can get this to go, is going to be the daily charts, okay? And this is what's going on right now. So the markets are up 1.1%. I'm laughing because the unemployment report, we'll talk about that in a second, but is there anything here that stands out, okay? Now, the same thing, all right? We're back to... 70, but if you go over here, going to relative strength on the short term, right? We're up in the 80s and now we're down in the 70s. So relative strength has gone down, markets have gone up. So what is that called? Negative divergence, okay? So one, the S&P, the Qs, I think, are overbought right now. Now, can we get to 5,000? Boy, it sure is looking likely right now. We'll see a lot of digest and Kind of surprising with that unemployment report because it really says the Fed's going to be higher for longer and probably won't see any type of cuts until now May, if not June. So very interesting to see the markets move. The other thing down here, okay, that I look at is what's called full stochastic. That's a momentum indicator, and that's very overbought as well, up in the 80s. So two signs there that really tell us that we should see some type of pullback. And I'm not saying you know, this big pullback, I'm just talking about 5 10% type pullbacks, which are very natural, and that might be your entry point at that time. Now, another thing that I look at as far as indicators, okay, is what's called the McKellen Oscillator, another momentum indicator. And the same thing we're seeing here, which is real interesting, right? So here's your S&P going up, but look at this, I mean, that is massive negative divergence. Why is there no momentum behind this? The market's moving up because it's a couple of companies, right? A couple of days ago, it was the MAG2, right? Which was NVIDIA and Microsoft. And now we'll add Meta to that. Outside of that, no. Now again, Amazon had a, a decent report is helping as well, but that's it. And I'm going to talk about that in a second. The other thing is, you know, a lot of noise. We've been negative all this time while the market was going up. Went down, went positive the other day, went negative, and then we went positive again yesterday. So a lot of noise on the short-term signal, something that has me uh, overall concern. Now, and I talk about market breadth. Let's see if that works. There you go. This shows you the S&P sectors, right? There's 11 of them through the month of January. Now, it's not going to look any different today, by the way. In fact, it'll look worse because some of the sectors I know that are down. But... Obviously, you're seeing a lot of negative. Now, what's positive over here? Financials, 1.5%, no big deal. Healthcare, that's one of the sectors we're in. We'll talk about that. But everything else has been weak year to date. Now, over here is tech. Now, you've got tech and communication services. But communication services, Google and Meta, okay? So you have to be careful when you think about communications. We're not talking about Ma Bell here, okay? So... That's what I talk about when it gets to that breath that is missing here. And, you know, can the MAG 3, 4 keep it going? Sure, right? I mean, but we'll see. To be determined, next up, Sector Spotlight. Sector Spotlight, I always like to start with the Treasury, the 10-year Treasury, right? They always say the bond market's smarter. So we've had some pretty interesting moves here recently, right? This was last year, right? Yields go up and then price go down. So bonds were a terrible place to be. Now, this move here was really generated from the Treasury. When the Treasury went out last time, and I talked about adding to our process, they had that QRA. I talked about that, that $760 billion. 
what they did was they went to shorter notes, in, in particular, quite a bit of T-bills, which is one year less, and that helped drive the yield down. Now, felt like it was a little bit of a false move. We'll see how to counter trend move. It looked like we were going down. Now, again, here's that disparity between the markets, okay? So the market went up, but all of a sudden, the bond market surged today because of that unemployment report. So very interesting. I think it's short term. I do still feel that we roll over from here. We do not have, uh, excuse me, we have a small, less than 2% duration position, duration 7, 10, 20, 30 year type bonds. We do have some ultra shorts, one year less, T-bills, et cetera, that I mentioned. So, you know, not ready to make a big move here into this market as far as bonds, but to be determined. Uranium, right? We have a go anywhere process. Uranium has really been a great move for us. Yesterday really had a substantial move. Why? Well, because one of the major manufacturers came out and said there's no way that we can handle all the demand, right? So supply demand, prices go up. So at this point, I'm not saying it's a time to buy. We've owned it for a while. Let's see if we get a consolidation. If not, a little bit of a pullback will be a good opportunity to add. So from there, I talked about healthcare. Now this is XLV ETF. We do not own this full disclosure. Figure it's easier to show, but you can look at healthcare and the move it's had. So it's a really good move. We've got three about to add a fourth name today. So like healthcare, have added some more alpha by owning some individual names as we go forward. Now India, right? When you look across the world, okay, and emerging markets excluding China, do like that. You see India slowly grinding higher. Would love to add to this, this, right? Continue to grow. And a new one we've talked about with our clients is Australia. You see that move, a big move up there. Over here, you have what's called a golden cross, 50 day above 200. So again, we like that. It's also in cycle one, which is Goldilocks, growth, growth, growth. So like it actually added to our position today. So next up, new section, the macro call. So after years shaking it up, we're going to have a macro call out section, bringing a couple items on the macroeconomic side or something that we feel is impacting or has the potential to impact. So this week, the big thing is all about employment. Now, as of the end of the week, latest list of layoffs, okay, over the last couple months. And this actually totals 102,000, okay? Now, just in January alone, we had 102,000 announced. So that's not hitting yet. They're announced, right? And we'll see what happens as we go forward, because why? Now, here is the unemployment comes out every Thursday with folks that are on unemployment. 224, highest number we've had since November. Same with ongoing claims. But of course, this morning we had the big shocker, 335 or 355, the number, sorry, I forget off the top of my head, but we're expecting 175, a massive miss, okay, as we go forward. Now, keep in mind last year, 11 out of 12 months afterwards, they came down, they revised down. You also have the household number, which is different. The numbers get wanky, wonky sometimes, so we have to be careful when we're looking at that as we go forward. But employment has been the strongest part of it, right? And if employment's good, right, that's going to help drive consumption. Consumption's part of GDP, people spending money. All right, so next up, the big news this week is what happened with New York Community Bank, Community Bank, Regional Bank. So you see here they had this massive day on Thursday down 38%. So what happened? First, step back a year to March, Right? We know about those banks that went under, several, most since 2008. And then some of them, including New York Community Bank, they bought some of those assets of one of the banks that went under. But then they come out and a couple things happen. One, they're bleeding deposits. But two, the one thing we've spoken about quite a bit is about commercial real estate. Piece on 60 Minutes a couple weeks ago where owners are literally walking away from buildings. Why? Well, they have loans coming due. There's quite a bit coming due this year. And they're paying 2 3%. Now it's 8 9% with 30% occupancy, okay? Vacancy, excuse me. So big issue, and literally people are walking away from buildings. 
And that's exactly what happened here. They're based in Long Island. They've got 40% some loans in there, and they're also in Manhattan, and they're seeing some of those write-offs. So this is something we really have to watch as we go forward. Probably can't see this, but on the Fed notes the other day, they took out the statement, the U.S. banking system is sound and resilient. They took that out. Very interesting the same day that that actually happened as well. So with that, they have what's called the BTFP. When they had those bailouts, okay, what happened? The Fed created this program, BTFP. I'm not going to get it. It's just an acronym. Bottom line is they allowed all these banks that had these bonds that were underwater, okay? They were unrealized losses. So you could take those losses, bring it to here at par, par means at full value, and bar against it to help with liquidity. And right away, you saw it take off, slowly grown, but then at the end of the year, it really shot up about 50 billion. Why is this important? Because this week the Fed announced they're gonna close it in March and nobody thought that that was gonna happen. So a couple quick macro call outs. Let's go to signals and game plan. So last year, started talking about this quite a bit, options. The options market has gotten gargantuan, specifically what's called ODTE, same day options. Now, on average, they're representing 50% of daily volume. Some days, we've seen as high as 50 cents. Massive, 57%. Massive amounts, okay? So we added to our process, Tier 1 Alpha, and every day I get a lot, a lot of charts on what's going on in the options market because it can move the markets, right? You have all these, I'll keep it simple, volatility control funds all done through algorithms and computers, right? They're buying or selling based on certain factors. And when you have options, you have something called gamma. Negative, neutral, positive. Pretty simple, okay? And when you look at that, gamma exposure acts as a throttle for equity volatility. Volatility acts as a toggle for equity exposure. So what does that mean? Okay, buying and selling can happen more, right? In July, we were negative gamma. We saw the sell-off. And we've seen from November, we saw a positive gamma would happen. Now, year to date, well, first off, today it went positive. But in the last couple of days, we were positive, negative, positive. Been a lot of flip. I think this is like the sixth or seventh time that it's flipped this year. And you have what's called a flip line right now, 48.85, okay? So I do like this. But again, you're seeing a lot of these flips because we're at these high levels where we're overbought. So... Right now, when you look at everything, here's my signals and game plan. Now, I'm giving all the names, okay, for disclosure purposes. But the bottom line is, I talked about full stochastic, one of my momentum indicators. McKellen Oscillator, positive, okay. AI Fractal Math, that's a program I use that gives me all this data of everything that's happening in stocks. Upside capture, downside, uh, volume, volatility, everything and it creates a signal. Bottom line is, that's been the most consistent, has been positive since uh, November, and everything else really just went positive the other day. But again, all of these have flip-flopped except the one. So what's the game plan as we go forward? Not surprised of these flips, as I've said. When you're here at all-time highs without a lot of breath, you're gonna have movement, and we keep on seeing these signals. So. Even though these are positive today, it doesn't mean I'm buying because we're at all-time highs. Now, you get those type of signals, and we've had a pullback, those are great signals to buy. Vice versa, if they go negative, it'll be time to sell, take profits, or short, right? Same different thing. So today, we are very much neutral because we think the market is overbought. That being said, seeing a lot of opportunity in the markets, just added four positions today. I was waiting for this week with all this data. Another country added to a, well, I talked about Australia, added another sector, individual stocks. So the key is if the markets are overbought, there's still a lot of pockets out there with upside opportunity. And that's what we're looking to, that's what we're looking for as we go forward. As always, thanks for watching. Michael Loftus, Wealth and Wisdom TV.